President Ferdinand Marcos journeyed to the Soviet Union for a state visit in May 1976. He took the road to Moscow by stages. From Manila, his way stations were Khabarovsk in the Soviet Far East and Novosibirsk in deep Siberia, arriving in Moscow 36 hours after leaving the Philippines. The trip paralleled the development of Philippine-Soviet relations, which has taken place by lengthy, progressive stages. When Mr. Marcos stepped on Soviet soil in Khabarovsk, he breached the last barrier remaining from the Cold War. Of all the major socialist countries, only the Soviet Union, motherland of socialism, remained to be formally recognized by the Philippines. The Khabarov stopover hardly allowed time for a quick tour of the city, an industrial and cultural center in the Soviet Far East, just 300 kilometers from the Pacific coast. But for Mr. Marcos and his party, including Foreign Secretary Carlos P. Romulo, it was an instructive introduction to the protocol of Soviet officialdom. The Philippine party had its similar rest stop in Novosibirsk, Siberia's biggest city, before inflaming to Moscow. Mrs. Marcos, coming from an official trip to France, arrived in Moscow 10 minutes before her husband's plane was due. Soviet President Nikolai Podgorny led the official welcome at Moscow Sheremetyevo Airport. But a more familiar figure to the Filipinos was the Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gomiko. The Sheremetyevo welcome was measuredly correct and impressive. A mixed Soviet honor guard showed off its ceremonial routine to perfection, and the Moscow diplomatic corps was in full attendance, though public representation was token. The route to the Kremlin from the airport passed through Lenin Prospect, the broad avenue down which honored visitors and triumphant cosmonauts enter Moscow. From Lenin Prospect, it is a short drive to the Kremlin, citadel of Soviet power today as it was of Tsarist power in the past. Dating back to the foundation of Moscow in the 12th century, the Kremlin walls, guarded by 22 towers, enclose architectural treasures built over the centuries. 15th century cathedrals raise their gold and silver domes above 19th century palaces and contemporary edifices. These buildings today house the magnificent panoply of Tsarist wealth alongside the Zomber offices of Soviet leaders. Today, state visitors are lodged in the resplendent suites of the Grand Kremlin Palace, one-time residence of the Tsars. Open to the public every day since July 1955, the Kremlin throngs with visitors day and night. Among the outdoor attractions is the 40-ton Tsar cannon cast in 1586. The day he arrived in Moscow, President Marcos began his talks with the Soviet leaders, headed by Podgorny, at the Kremlin's historic Yekaterinsky Hall, named after Catherine the Great. President Podgorny was assisted by Foreign Minister Andrei Gomiko and Kirill Mazarov, Deputy Prime Minister. On the Philippine panel sat Foreign Secretary Carlos P. Romulo, Secretary of Finance Cesar Birata, Secretary of Industry Vicente Paterno, Secretary of Information, Francisco Estatad, Solicitor General Estelito Mendoza, Major General Fabian Ver, and the Presidential Assistant, Juan Tovera. President Podgorny remarked on contacts between the two nations, which date back to the last century, when Russian seafarers and travelers visited Philippine ports on several occasions. 
The Marcos administration allowed a number of friendship missions by Philippine legislators. But the most dramatic icebreaker was the First Lady's 10-day official visit in 1972. On her return to Manila, the Philippines' USSR Friendship Society was formed with Mrs. Marcos as honorary chairman. This time in Moscow, Madame Marcos met with members of the counterpart Soviet Philippine Friendship Society, which has worked actively since 1974 to develop contacts and cultural relations with the Philippines, and has helped the Soviet people to know about the culture, history, and life of the Filipino people. In fact, it has chapters in each of the Soviet republics. The organization has sent several delegations to visit the Philippines. In turn, it helps Filipino delegations visiting the USSR to know more about the Soviet people through encounters and Soviet specialists and visits to educational, research, and cultural establishments. A special assembly was convoked for Mrs. Marcos at Friendship House on Kalinian Prospect. Welcoming officials included Zenaida Kruklova, President of the Union of Friendship Societies, and Soviet Minister of Publications, Boris Tukhalin, who heads the Soviet Philippine Society. A display of books and magazines from the Philippines was eagerly disposed of to society members. A balalaika quartet, a short ballet performance and songs by Moscow's famous artists, followed the speeches. At the end of the visit, a delegation of eight gifted children presented Mrs. Marcos with their drawings depicting Soviet life and favorite characters from fairy tales and fables. On this trip, the official encounters between Philippine and Soviet leaders helped to lay down the firm foundations of an international friendship, bridging immense distances of geography, culture, and politics. The difference in political systems notwithstanding, Filipinos and Russians have much to hold them together. Both share the experience of historic struggle in defense of the homeland during World War II. Deep-seated traditions which revolve around the family, a multiplicity of internal cultures. For just as the Philippines has about 90 ethnic communities, each with its own language and tribal or regional culture, the Soviet Union has 105 nationalities, ranging from the Slavs of Eastern Europe to the Orientals of Soviet Asia. On the evening of May 31st, the Soviet government and the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet honored their guests from the Philippines with a state dinner at the Chamber of Facets in the Grand Kremlin Palace. On the occasion, President Marcos formally sought the support of the Soviet Union for the goal of the five-member association of Southeast Asian nations to establish a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality in their region. In an exchange of toasts with President Podgorny, the President described his eight-day state visit as a milestone in the Philippines' relations with the world dramatizing the country's decisive break from its colonized past to genuine independence and friendship with all nations. Of Dayton, President Marcos observed that it could be effective only if it extended worldwide. Like peace, he said, Dayton cannot be selective. It is indivisible. For his part, President Podgorny described the Philippine president's visit as a new page in the history of relations between the two nations. He said, the positions of his country and the Philippines on many international issues were identical and constituted a solid basis for cooperation and combined efforts for world peace. Special tribute was given to the First Lady, Mrs. Imelda Romualdez Marcos, for her efforts in promoting Philippine-Soviet friendship. President and Mrs. Marcos hosted a return dinner three days later at the Zalotec restaurant, located in a wooded area within the grounds of the USSR Permanent Exhibition of Economic Achievements, some 10 miles from downtown Moscow.
The Marcus's second day in Moscow, June 1st, opened with a wreath-laying ceremony at the Lenin Mausoleum. For many foreigners in Russia, the most powerful image of the Soviet social system is the long line of people in Red Square, waiting for hours to pay homage to Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, supreme leader, saint and hero of the Soviet people. Lenin died in 1924 after midwifing the incredible birth of the world's first socialist state. His well-preserved corpse has been on public view in Red Square for over four decades. Even for those who have never been to Moscow, modern communications have made familiar the orderly queues of Soviet citizens in patient, often emotional, fulfillment of a central obligation in their belief. The president's visit to Lenin's final resting place was followed by wreath-laying rites at the tomb of the unknown soldier, also lying just outside the Kremlin walls. given a tour of the Franze, a military academy of the Soviet state. Soviet military programs and the training of cadets. He viewed with interest the Academy's museum, which holds a complete collection of war memorials dating back to the revolution of 1918. First Lady was a special guest at the State School of Circus and Variety Arts. A performance given by the students gave Mrs. Marcus an overview of Russian popular arts, ballet, acrobatics, mime and juggling, among others. Certainly, a major event in the state visit, the meeting between President Marcos and Chairman Brezhnev of the Communist Party, was scheduled that same day. The First Lady was also present for the meeting. The amenities between the two leaders sparked with spontaneous cordiality and warmth. On greeting the First Lady, Chairman Brezhnev expressed regret that he was not present on her first visit to Moscow.
President Marcos was accompanied by Secretary of Foreign Affairs Carlos P. Romulo with Secretary General Brezhnev, Set Minister Gromyko. Later that afternoon, heads of diplomatic missions accredited to the USSR were presented to the President and the First Lady at the Kremlin. allowed the presidential party to enjoy the excellence of famed Russian ballet. At the Kremlin Palace of Congresses, Don Quixote, a ballet in three acts, was performed by the Bolshoi. <laughs> On June 2, the visit moved to its high point with the signing of agreements at the Kremlin by President Marcos for the Philippines and Chairman Podgorny for the Soviet government. Two documents were signed, a trade agreement and a joint communique announcing the formal establishment of diplomatic relations between the two countries. With formal relations and a trade agreement, the Philippines gains a vast new market for her raw materials and agricultural commodities. The joint communique also pledged the promotion of cultural, 
intellectual, scientific, and technical exchange and express the two nations' solidarity in the search for peaceful coexistence among nations. The trade agreement was signed by Secretary of Finance Cesar Virata and Soviet Minister of Foreign Trade Nikolai Patoli. Earlier that day, the President was given a tour of the Kremlin. He visited the rooms that had been occupied by Lenin, including the hall where Lenin first convoked the Soviet Presidium. Lenin's quarters now house much of his memorabilia. The president also visited the famed armory where the relics of Tsarist Russia, including the fabulous crown jewels, are on permanent display. This museum is the most popular attraction of the Kremlin. At the headquarters of the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, better known as Comic-Con, President Marcos was briefed by officers of the organization. Comic-Con was founded in January 1949 as an economic alliance of the Soviet bloc socialist countries. It is often called the Communist Common Market. The economic organization is based on the identical economic system of the member countries who also have a common political system and ideology. The Philippines now has formal diplomatic relations with most of the Comic-Con countries. At every turn, Moscow offers its visitors fascinating aspects of the city, which is the center of Soviet life, the hub of its culture and commerce. It is a good place to try and begin to know a people of such great diversity and a land of such overwhelming immensity. Moscovites surprised the Filipinos with a way of life which Cold War propaganda has so well misrepresented. Swarming into theaters, cafes, and cinemas, the Russians show a prodigious capacity to enjoy life's pleasures. Indeed, much of what the Filipinos saw matched their own zest for life and festivity. On June 3, President Marcos, the first lady and their party, flew to Leningrad, which is to Moscow what New York is to Washington. It is one of Russia's hero cities like Moscow and Stalingrad, famed for the heroism of their citizens in the Russian defense against Hitler's forces in World War II. The incredible German siege of 900 days brought death to one million Leningraders, but never the surrender of the this brave city. A World War II hero himself, the president paid eloquent tribute to the heroism of Leningrad in a visit to the War Memorial Cemetery of Piskarevka. Leningrad is a symbol of a people's refusal to accept defeat, a symbol of hope for oppressed peoples, even in the remotest corner of the earth, President Marcos said. The Piskarevka Cemetery, with its acres and acres of grave markers, is an awesome reminder of the human cost of the city's defense. The war memorials are everywhere in Russia. In every city, every village, eternal flames burn to attest to a people's grateful remembrance 
of their valiant soldiers. The Piscarafka Memorial Monument is at once awesome and moving to visitors of any race or creed. A visit to the cruiser Aurora, moored on the Neva River, served to remind visitors of historic days when the Bolsheviks finally brought down the Tsar and put an end to Russia's long centuries of feudalism. From the decks of the Aurora, sympathetic sailors of the Tsar's navy fired the guns that signaled the storming of the Winter Palace at the outbreak of the 1917 October Revolution. Later, the entire delegation visited the Winter Palace of the Tsars, a classically beautiful architectural complex, now housing the famed Hermitage Collection of Art. It is one of the world's most fabulous museums. The original museum was Catherine the Great's Hermitage, built as an annex of the Winter Palace. But it grew to accommodate Catherine's grand acquisitions of the finest European art, and additions made by the later Tsars. Under the Soviet government, the collection is displayed throughout the 2,500 rooms of the Winter Palace. It has two and a half million art objects, including 14,000 paintings, among them two Leonardos, a whole gallery of Rubenses, and a great many fine representative works of the major Renaissance and Impressionist masters, as well as Russian masters of the last two centuries. Its holdings are an awe-inspiring reminder of the cultural wealth which surrounds the people of the Soviet Union in their cities. Leningrad broke many more of their stereotypes about the Soviet people and their lifestyle. Economic five-year plans have not only made the Soviet Union a superpower and a giant of world industry, they are now directly seen and felt as material benefits to the masses of Russia, only 50 years ago the most backward nation of Europe. The Soviet worker reaps the rewards of his work and of the system in a minimum standard of living that assures him of a job, free education to university level, social housing, nominal expenses for rent, transportation, medical services and utilities, sufficient food, and an increasing access to consumer goods, including cars, country duchess, and jewelry. The Soviets move about with vigor and self-assurance, a passion for living, reflected in the grand themes of classical Russian literature, still informs the 20th century lifestyle of the Soviet people, little quenched by the strictures of socialism. The Russian visit came to a close for Mrs. Marcos in Leningrad. After a hectic two days, the President and the First Lady headed for different destinations. The First Lady flew to Vancouver to address Habitat, the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements. The president flew on to Volgograd, one Stalingrad to visit the heartland of Soviet industry, and from there to Tashkent, capital of Uzbekistan in Soviet Asia. Tashkent was the seat of ancient trade caravans, flying between the Orient and Europe, gateway of ancient conquerors who set out to search for new lands and new territories. A traveler of the 20th century, President Marcos spent eight days in the Soviet Union to win fresh alliances and newcomers for the Philippines. This trip was the final seal on the pragmatic diplomacy of friendship for all nations, which he has pursued with determination since he broke the single-minded dependence on the United States, which had for so long characterized Philippine foreign policy.
Thank you for watching. For more information, you can visit our website bagonglipunan.com, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram.